uh, and we are meeting uh, through the WebEx technology. And I've got a little script here I need to read uh, as we commence the meeting. So we're conducting this meeting by electronic means as permitted by the open meeting law, which is uh, Minnesota Statutes 13D because of the extraordinary circumstances due to COVID-19. For this meeting, members will join by telephone or other electronic means. The meeting is also being live streamed and recorded. Greg, thanks for making that possible for the public. Uh, I recommend having the agenda and items before you for reference during the meeting. And then uh, Elaine has put together a few guidelines for us uh, to help ensure the meeting goes as smoothly as possible. Um, so first of all, uh, having public comment is really difficult. So why they, they, why they can listen to the meeting, uh, what we need to do with public comment is uh, encourage members of the public to email the staff contacts on the tab webpage uh, with any comments they might have. Uh, there's no open microphone for them for this particular type of meeting. Uh, everyone other than the pe uh, person speaking should have their microphone on mute and turn their video off to save bandwidth. I don't think we need to do that. I'd prefer to have the video on, so that's another way I can tell if somebody has a question. Uh, and then uh, just turn the audio on if you have it, uh, you have that ability when you want to speak. And then um, they're asking that all discussions and requests uh, to speak can be directed through me. Uh, when you want to make a comment, ask a question or participate in a discussion, either please type into the chat uh, box, the chat bubble. I have a comment or I have a question to indicate you'd like to speak or just simply raise your hand and I'll be able to try to uh, call on people that way as well. Uh, and then I'll ask uh, Greg to unmute the particular person that raises their hand or you can unmute yourself. Um, I'll call on members in the order I see <clears throat> their hands go up or their comments come in on the chat line. And members who use a uh, phone connection only should speak up when I call for any other discussion on the item. Uh, because conversations among several people by electronic means uh, may be cumbersome, we should limit our discussions to the business items and issues directly related to the business items. And then we ask that members again state their name when they're speaking to ensure that members of the public can follow our discussion with ease. Uh, and then to the extent that you can, please refrain from uh, speaking over or talking over other speakers. When you participate in discussions, please speak directly into the receiver microphones, receiver microphones so that we can all uh, hear you well. And then when you make a motion or second a motion, please state your name so I know the motion has been made and uh, who has seconded it. And then our recording secretary, Jana, will be able to record this information for the record. Uh, and because we're doing this meeting electronically, as you remember from our last experience, all votes have to be taken by roll call. Uh, we're gonna be able to consolidate one of those things. And that is when I do the roll call of who's uh, a present, uh, we'll also, deal with approval of the agenda at the same time so we can uh, we can handle a roll call vote in that circumstance uh, along with the roll call uh, roll call on the agenda vote on the agenda and the roll call of members uh, can be handled in a single item um, Jenna will call the roll in alphabetical order uh, and we need to be able to hear your vote so you'll have to um, have to unmute yourself to vote when your name is called for each vote, uh, clearly state yay or nay or abstain, uh, so I can determine whether a majority vote has been achieved in each uh, with each particular motion. So, um, are there any other questions before we uh, uh, call the meeting to order? Okay, see a few heads. I see no hands. Okay, terrific. Uh, well, now I will call the meeting of the a tab. Recall it to order. It is now twelve forty. Uh, and we, uh, is there anyone who may, wishes to make a, a change to the agenda? Otherwise, we'll combine the approval of the agenda and the roll call of folks present in a single motion. I will All move right. approval of the agenda, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? And I you... second it. And I second that. And who was that? And you're, no, you're on. For anyone making motions, please identify themselves before the motion in seconds. Mary, Mary Heyman Roland made the motion. And who was the seconder? Oh, I was the seconder. I was the seconder, Mr. Chair, but the, the alarms are going off in my building, so I just have to unmute myself quick. 
All right. So that I, yeah, Mary Jo, make sure you identify yourself now because we got a split screen here. So that was that was Commissioner McGuire that made the second. All right. Yep. Now we're going to go to roll call. Uh, any any further discussion? Okay, we're going to go to roll call, and this will call both uh, those present and also approval of the agenda in a single in a single motion. Jana. Okay, how's my audio? You're good. Okay. Anderson. Present. Bailey. Yep, here, present. And why don't you say Barber. present, uh, present and I. Barber. Present and I. Barnes. Present and I. Boyles. Present and I. Crimmins. Present and I. Dugan. Present and I. Foster. Present, I. Fox. Present, I. Geisler. Present, I. Giuliani Stevens. Present, I. Gattel. Or Jan Callison. Okay. Heyman Roland. Tim and Roland. You're on mute, Mary. Aye. Present, aye. I forgot to unmute. Sorry. Hanson. Present, aye. Holberg. Present, aye. Collinshead. Present, aye. Karlowski. Present, aye. Lindicky. Present, aye. Look. Present, aye. Malichnik. Malichnik? He's there. Present, aye. <laughs> and then Bewin? Present, aye. McGuire? Present, aye. Narayanan? Narayanan? Present, aye. Patrick? Patrick? Present, I. Reich? Present, I. Sanger? Or Lewis? Present, I. Denver? Present, I. Stephenson? Present, I. Swanson? Or Jepson? Tolbert? Or Jalali Nelson? Ulrich? Present, I. Winchittle? Or Wang? Washi? Okay. All right, thank you, Jana. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was that if anybody has a technology problem, you can call Greg Ritchie at 651-602-1666. Uh, That's 651-602-1635. All right, now normally we would go to the public forum portion of the agenda. Chair, Chair. The, uh, yes. Uh, I would I I was uh, administratively muted and I figured out how to unmute. This is Chris Tolbert, but I was present and I for that last vote. Um, Thanks, Tolbert. And for the record, we have Gattel present as well. All right. Good. Thank you, Member Tolbert. Um, so uh, we've already discussed how we're going to handle public input for the meeting, uh, and now we will move on to uh, Chair's report. Uh, I have a minimal chair report uh, this particular uh, session. We uh, have determined that we would cancel executive committee meetings until further notice. And uh, that notification went out to the members of the executive committee. And uh, we'll just have to wait and see how things go in conjunction with the uh, governor's stay at home orders and everything else that allows us to uh, 
reconvene either as a full tab or an exec committee. Uh, and that was the only piece of uh, information that I had uh, to share with the, with the group today. And then we'll move on to uh, MnDOT and Mike Barnes. This, uh, Mike, uh, that Highway 5 project, Highway 5 project we've all been having angst about, uh, this is probably a good time to be working on that. Yes, Mr. Chair and members, um, the construction, we are getting going on a number of projects. We have some that started early and we're making use of different different times. I know you referenced the Highway okay, 5 project. I know there's been some questions in that about some, some tour signing. So we're, we're working on just like any of the bigger projects when they start, there's always kind of the nuances of getting things set up. So we're, we're working, working through those, but projects are starting. We're, um, we're trying to take advantage of the fact of the, of the, the traffic and, and even some of the different activities, even in maintenance that we can do at different times that we would normally have to do under heavier traffic. So, so if there's questions and as we go, I can, I can address those or send things. Um, one thing we've been doing is, um, and even for the daily, daily briefings, there's been uh, more questions on traffic. So we have put together some some traffic information that accounts for about 100 traffic center sensors across the state and a thousand sensors here in the metro that have been monitoring the traffic, and it shows how the traffic patterns have been, you know, decreasing and, and increasing at different times based on different executive orders and there's, um, it basically kind of shows how we've don't have congestion, which is again is, is obvious to those that are that are down here in the metro. Um, but it has a lot of other information. So what I was going to do, Mr. Chair, is send a link to Elaine and have it where folks can kind of look at it. And if we do want to have some form of a presentation when the timing's right, when we can either we get used to doing this, we can have folks show it, or when things get a little more back to what would be semi-normal. Um, also then we, uh, people have been asking questions about, about funding. So we, uh, we also all send a, a link that kind of shows kind of what the funding itself there's, uh, when it comes to transportation funding here in the state, I won't get in the, the, the details of that because of the timing here, but I'll send that to Elaine too. So, so with that, I guess, uh, other than if there's any, any questions, that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Member Barnes. Uh, one of the things I was appreciative of was a couple of weeks ago, I think MnDOT announced that they were going to continue uh, on a pathway to, to perform all the projects they had uh, outlined for the particular for this particular calendar year. And it struck me that there were over 500 projects statewide that you were going to be working on. And I thought that was terrific news for the economy. And I uh, see what's happening in Congress now as they're talking about further uh, funding and, and some of it would be infrastructure related. So we may even may, we may see even more infrastructure funding coming our way. Any comment on that? Yeah, and that's the part where again with it, there's there, we got we're doing planning and scenarios. It goes from you just mentioned there could be additional funding uh, from the federal level, but with that in conjunction is just our state funding as you project out will be uh, reduced. So it ranges from you know, shift and change of our current program based on projected state funding to the potential of getting additional. So it, there's a number of different scenarios that are being you know, put together and plans and we're looking at how to scope some additional projects and and um, people have lots of different ideas too of what projects may be able to be there if there's any additional funding. So there'll be, there'll be more coming out on it, but again, we have to plan basically for what feels like a pretty pretty wide range, kind of like back when we had the R program, you know, this depends on the requirements if you have to, if it has to be not in the current program or, you know, whatever the requirements are, are there. So we're, we're trying to make sure we're, we're ready and, and flexible, so. Good, thank you. Uh, questions for uh, Member Barnes, MnDOT related, anybody? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, I see that Todd Bewin is with us today from the MPCA. Uh, Member Bewin, anything you wish to report from an MPCA standpoint? Sure, I'll be brief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, our primary um, TAB member, Craig McDonald, um, who's our Assistant Commissioner for AIR, was redeployed pretty quickly 
four weeks ago when this really hit, when the COVID-19 started to hit, he was redeployed to the governor's office. So he's uh, not, we really haven't seen him at all for about four weeks and we're not sure exactly what, when we'll see him again. But anyway, so you got me today. Um, just a couple things. Um, one of the things that we were going to be doing was to be publishing our draft clean cars rule in later in late March. And we have delayed that because when that's published, that really opens a public comment period. And until we can figure out how to have public meetings, public participation, and a public hearing in a safe way, um, we have we are not. Uh, we're going to delay that publication of that draft rule. We we still are hoping to continue work on the clean cars rule here in 2020, um, but we're just sort of taking a wait and see approach on how we can do the public participation and when we can get that started. So that was one item, the clean cars rule making. The second item is just on the Volkswagen uh, settlement that does continue to move ahead as planned. We're doing virtual stakeholder meetings here later in April. And that's for interested parties in our electric school bus pilot project and other phase two grants that are being um, continuing to move forward. It's kind of been interesting. We've been getting a fair amount of questions about air quality and the impacts of um, COVID-19 on air quality in Minnesota. And, you know, Minnesota has pretty, pretty good air quality generally, um, a little bit less um, good in, in the metro area, but um, we haven't necessarily seen a, a change here yet. Uh, we're, our monitoring data is still being looked at to see if there was any, any change over the last few weeks. We do know that in very, very large cities in, um, in Asia, for example, they had a significant reduction in um, pollution um, as as a result of COVID-19 and people just battening down the hatches in their in their homes and stuff and businesses. But um, here in Minnesota, we're getting a number of questions about that, but we don't really have a significant change to report at this time. So I just thought that was kind of interesting that people are interested in knowing um, if we're seeing a change and we'll continue to look at our data to see if that if that does happen. But that's all I really had for now. Are there any questions? Any questions for member B1? All right, folks, we'll move on then to the uh, MAC uh, and member Crimmins is with us today. Member Crimmins, anything that you wish to report on? Uh, I would think there would be some significant uh, airline impact here locally and, and uh, how it affects the MAC. It'd be interesting to all of us. So. Member Crimmins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? You can. Okay, beautiful. Uh, just a few things to add that last week, air traffic, uh, passenger traffic was down 95% from the year before. Our concessions are down, 20, only 20% 20 of concessions are open. Parking is down 98%. So the only highlight we can see is the construction on Highway 5. Uh, we, there was some preliminary work we had to do on a terminal property, but because of the low flow of traffic, we've foregone that construction and MnDOT has been able to go ahead and they should be, uh, they, this might help them finish early. But that right as of this date, we did qualify for 120, around 120 million of federal. Funds to be used to offset cost at the airport. And at this time, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, no, see, I got cut out now. Hello? Yeah, you're, uh, you were cutting it out, there, but you, I think you got me. Yep. Get out. Somebody have a question for Member Crimmins? What, uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, Carl, I've got one for you. With respect to the businesses that have had to close out there, they're all they're all tenants of the MAC. Uh, are you engaging in some sort of forbearance uh, or deferral of rent strategy out there at the, at the MAC to 
extend their leases in exchange for not paying rent for a, a period of time? Yes, Mr. Chair. We're working with each concessionaire and each person with a lease to uh, not forego, but for to stall payments for the next three months. And we might even look at their minimum annual guarantee as rent. And so that the uh, staff at MAC is working with all the concessionaires and the rental car companies to uh, to work out some issuance, like you say, of some support for their uh, activities. So usually if memory serves me right, you, you've got about $400 million a year in capital projects out there. It strikes me that with all of the financial obligations that you've got uh, with respect to, uh, uh, I don't think you've been paying for things on a cash as you go basis, like the parking ramps and everything else, uh, things that have been financed that might affect your capital improvement program because you need to divert funds just uh, being able to cover your your uh, normal costs that would otherwise be covered in some other fashion by by rent or some other payments you, you might be receiving from passenger fees, et cetera. Yes, uh, staff is going over the list of capital improvements. Some of them have been uh, financed already through bonding, and those are going to proceed, and others they're going to determine on a case by case basis which ones should be put off for a year or two years. We're seeing uh, by the end of 2020, air traffic will probably be back to what it was in the 80s or the 90s. And so it, when this turns around, air traffic is not coming back for at least a year or more to the levels that we left at today or yet a week ago. All right, did that, did that prompt any other questions for Member Crimmins, air travel related? Right. One, I had one other question uh, for Crimmins, and that was, uh, and you may not be able to answer this question, but it strikes me that one of the things that airlines are going to have to be able to do is to uh, demonstrate to the traveling public that their air filtration systems have improved dramatically over what we've all experienced in air travel, that they've got to be able to tout some kind of um, efficiencies there that they've never had to deal with before in terms of keeping air clean. Comment on that? Uh, no, I, I, that's something I would have to defer to the airlines. Okay, all right, thank you. Anything else for Member Crimmins? All right, we'll move on to uh, Deb Barber at the uh, Metropolitan Council who has a, a, a her regular report, I think. She's gonna talk about some of the work that the bus drivers are doing in Metro Mobility's grocery delivery program, but the delivery program. Deb also has a COVID presentation that she's uh, uh, going to make for us. So, Member Barber, welcome. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, want to give a little update on our ridership and operations. Um, our messaging overall has been one of the most important things that we can do to protect our frontline staff, continuing to convey the message that transit is for essential travel only. And even on those essential trips, um, people who have a viable non-transit option should not be riding transit. Thankfully, we're continuing to see low ridership in response to the impacts from the stay-at-home order and request to limit continue to see low ridership in response impact stay-at-home order and request to limit travel to essential trips. This past, past week, the week of April 6th to April 12th, system ridership was down 70% overall. The ridership declines are greater than 90% for Express Bus and North Star. For our Metro Mobility and Transit Link, ridership has also declined by about 80%. So some of the changes that we've done in operations. Um, we include reduced hours of service, so there's no service between 11 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. Uh, reduced service levels to about 60% of normal operations, similar to service levels um, around over holidays, um, such as like the day after or around Thanksgiving. Uh, where buses allow, um, we uh, went to rear door boarding only for passengers um, to provide some uh, additional protection for our operators. We also have added buses on any route where the amount of passengers not allow for appropriate social distancing. Not allow for distancing. So we've added longer buses on areas that have more. Would you pause for a moment, Carl? Would you put yourself on mute? Go in there. Go. Do you want to go on there anyway? You're still not on mute. Maybe Greg, can you put Carl on mute? 
in the history. <laughs> she down along the bottom. You know, run your run your honest. mouse along the bottom of the screen, and there's a and there's a mute button there, over in the true. far left. Might be off the meeting. Greg, can you yeah, mute I'm Carl? To, kind of, Carl, Carl um, just don't touch it. Don't touch anything right now. Let me just do it. I, th I think we're kind of competing against each other here. Okay, you're, he's muted now. Okay. No. Uh, oh, I don't think he's muted. Okay. Um, uh, he was, and then, oh, okay. Um, Carl, 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 don't do anything. Carl, and Greg will mute you. Okay, okay Dave, he's go muted ahead. now. Well, he okay. keeps. All right. <sighs> okay. All right, so for no. method mobility, um, we've changed some things as well. We moved to single rides rather than share ride trips so that um, passengers are on, not on a bus with other passengers. Uh, for both Metro Mobility and Transit Link, we started delivering food from grocery Let stores and shelves, stores and shelves, right. which is a free service to anyone, well, not just registered to 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 pause a bit. <laughs> Carl, can you hear us? Carl. Carl. Let's try just to, today's what? All right, you're on mute now, Carl. Don't worry about touching okay. anything. Don't worry about anything. <laughs> All right. All right. So it's a free service for anyone, not just registered customers. Um, for Metmo customers who are a vulnerable population for the virus, this service reduce, um, redu helps reduce the need for travel. On Monday, we are start, uh, we started using Metro Mobility Services also as transit for essential workers in healthcare. The service is 24-7 and picks up uh, workers at their home and takes them to work. All they need to do is to be traveling to a healthcare facility and show their badge. The service was needed as we reduced transit overall. The demand was quickly developed for this service launch on Monday, but if we have capacity, we will expand to other essential workers in need. Lastly, we have significantly increased cleaning of transit vehicles and drivers are being issued masks. Uh, onto sort of the financial and staff impacts. Um, there's been a significant reduction in revenue from sources that fund transit, including MVEST and transit fares. Uh, the region will be receiving 226 million in federal funds from the CARES Act to help fill in for the drops in revenue. At this point, a full financial impact is unknown, but it's something that we um, are continually monitoring. We currently have enough operators and staff to maintain the reduced level service levels, but are also monitoring that closely. We've had two drivers test positive for COVID in Metro Transit and have detailed protocols in place to minimize the risk to, um, to our workforce and our cu customers. Um, I will say both those operators were in a, in a, training, um, in a training center, not um, out interfacing with the public. Um, other council impacts, um, our wastewater system continues to function as expected, but we have implemented extensive protocols to separate staff who might work at plants and in a field with other workers. Uh, so that there's no critical shortage of workforce to maintain this essential service. Lastly, um, our region's great investment in parks and, tr and trails has been a real bright spot in this emergency, providing a great place for people to go. As you've all probably experienced, um, park usage is up dramatically, but of course we're continuing to um, try and reinforce um, the, the concept of social distancing so that people can go out and enjoy the outdoors um, as well. Um, and and so that would cover the basics of my report. So I'll pause for any questions. Thank you, Member Barber. Uh, Member Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Member Barber, for the presentation. I have two questions. Which routes still have high ridership in the in metro area? And then are fares being collected and enforced on the buses, trains, and so, BRT? Um, any, so for the, with your collecting and going, if you're rear boarding, we're not requiring that somebody go do that, but for like the C-Line and the and, and the LRTs, um, because there is off board um, fare payments, um, that we're still encouraging that. Um, we, we, because we are focusing our efforts in different areas, I'm not sure what the level of enforcement or what we're doing specifically to that at this point. Um, then uh, to your other uh, question, I'd have to get back to you. I know there are a couple of routes that we had to put longer buses on uh, because we um, 
they were getting a little too crowded. And so wherever we um, wherever we've seen that um, situation, we're trying to kind of respond to that in a dynamic way so that we make sure that people can be on the bus but space properly. So, but I can get you the actual route numbers. Yep. All right. Member Foster, go ahead. I said, thank you for that. And if you can pass on to Metro Transit staff, the drivers, operators, and maintenance crews, tell them thank you. They're really putting themselves out there for us as a community. And a That's great to hear, and, and they are doing a lot of good work right now. They're doing a lot of good work right now, both on a regular basis, and like you said, some of these other programs we put in place. Um, I'm super proud of our creative staff and very proud of the operators. Yes, thank you, Member Foster, for that uh, compliment. That's yes, I did. I just, yes. Mr. Chair, thank yes. you. I just, uh, Member one B. thing I did want to add to my report from the MPCA is that um, um, it may not have been obvious, but our air monitoring function is an essential function, is an essential service that we prioritized. There's only a, a, a handful of things in our agency that are priority one services and air quality monitoring is one of them. So I just wanted to add that to my report that, that so folks know that that's my report. That does continue really in this kind of a situation. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you, Member B1. And then back to Member Barber, I think uh, Commissioner Gattel mm -hmm. had a question that was EBT related. Uh, I saw it come in on the chat line that uh, she was wondering how how you go about shopping uh, for people that uh, are receiving uh, uh, EBT benefits uh, when I think they have to maybe be there. I'm going to, to call on Director months. Thompson right. to type in here. Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Nick. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. So, yeah, that has been one of our challenges is prior to this that if you had a EBT, you had to show the payment in person. Um, and unfortunately, the, that is being been a, in pilot stage to in, in pilot stage allow online shopping with EBT, but only four states in the nation were allowed to do that. So we've been trying to work with federal government to get that changed. I don't believe that change has occurred yet, but we have for Metro Mobility customers, we have identified one location um, in Bloomington, and we're providing that to any of our customers that we can uh, process a transaction for them with EBT cards. And so we've got a kind of a, a fallback option, but that is one of our barriers that uh, we've encountered in food delivery is that the customers mostly have to go go and be present at the grocery to use their card. So hopefully we can get that resolved That's shortly, but um, the, the customers mostly have to go one of those nuances of trying to help the Hopefully people that need it the most and you uh, were uh, thwarted by uh, something you didn't anticipate. Right. Uh, Member Stevens, Member Stevens, did you have your hand up or were you just, didn't. okay. I think Mayor Mary had her hand up. Mayor Mary? You're muted. You're still on mute. You're on mute. You, you answered the question. So thank you. Okay, right. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else on this uh, portion of the agenda? All right. Uh, okay. um, we've got the we've got a presentation still too. Um, that'll be a very short presentation. Okay. Um, so if and I just want to say um, this is a rapidly changing situation. So anytime, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm um, more than happy to put you in touch with, if I don't have the answers, with someone to help you find answers. Um, so now we do have, and Mike Barnes had alluded to some of this, this is not the entire um, snapshot of everything, but we had a great presentation at Transportation Committee on Monday about the impacts of COVID-19 on um, metro area travel. And so we've got um, a quick presentation on that, and we have Ashley Asmus here to, to present. To present. So I'm going to turn it over to her. All right. And I know I saw her on. Yeah, I saw her on there as well. <laughs> yeah. You had this on, this was on the screen earlier, and I thought maybe you were just uh, presenting uh, a couple of slides and then. 
we had the little snafu with Carl's yeah. microphone. We're getting and, the time uh, in uh, here. Like here so we thought maybe you were it. finished with that, but uh, it's good to provide this information. I've seen it, and it's uh, worthwhile. It is helpful, I think, sir. So. Ashley's on mute. Okay, Ashley, unmute yourself, please. Ashley, you're still on mute. Oh, don't you love technology? Well, maybe if she can't get off mute, either you or Nick could walk through it. This, yeah. I, I, yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Nick. I can start, and if she, if it gets connect, or she connects, then I'll hand it over. So, um, is, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, so we've been tracking data since early March in real time to, at the request of uh, Minnesota Management Budget and also the governor's office and others trying to, I'm trying to understand what's happening with, in, in effect, social distancing um, with the different measures um, to inform whether the decisions and directives are, are making an impact on reducing travel and also keeping social distancing in effect. So we've got as uh, Member Barnes mentioned, we have a lot of good real-time data that has been in place and invested. Uh, so we're using a variety of data sources to try to understand those questions. Um, and then we're retooling some of our research, uh, for example, like our travel behavior inventory to collect even more real-time data directly from customers. Next slide, please. So our sources of data are MnDOT sensors that I think MnDOT is one of the most comprehensive real-time data sources of any major metropolitan and DOT in the nation. So it's really coming in hand, handy and my council staff and MnDOT staff working closely together. Then we also have a lot of variety of data collection techniques through our Metro Transit on each bus to measure uh, different passengers uh, loading at different times. Hi, Nick. Next Can slide. Can hear me? Oh, great. My computer you. chose to freeze just as Deb was <laughs> passing the baton to me. I thought that was great timing. Um, but hi. Okay, I'll yeah, hi pass everyone. it over this to you. Ashley okay, so, um, and thank you for that, Nick. So this is a, a static green screen grab from our online interactive mapping application. Um, and this link is in the slides, so you can visit this um, after we leave here. But what the map is showing you is the location of all of these thousand plus um, loop detector sensors across the metro area. And they're colored by how much um, traffic has decreased um, from typical. So we have some sort of innovative ways of modeling traffic at all of these different places that you know, we've built up in response to this COVID um, traffic decline, but that will come in really handy in modeling um, traffic for other purposes as well, including congestion analyses. We can go to the next slide. And the app is great. It is built by um, another data scientist here at the council. So I hope you all get a chance to explore it. There's some really rich data on there. Um, this is a graph showing you these declines in traffic over time. Um, the blue line is showing you the decline in traffic um, for the metro loop sensors. And the black line is showing you the uh, statewide numbers from those 100 plus um, sensors across the state on a variety of roadway types. So over the weekend, traffic was down about 70%. I think a lot of us were staying home with all that terrible weather. It's back up into um, about a 50% decline. So on track with previous weeks under the stay at home order. Um, and that area is shaded in gray. So you can see the effect of the stay at home order over the last couple of weeks. And we'll be looking at that continuing forward. Next slide. So this data, we um, each morning we compile it um, from all of these 1,000 sensors. We grab MnDOT's calculations and we put these into um, uh, flat files and share them with the state um, on our GitHub site. So we're set up to share both code and data with the public on our GitHub site. And those data um, are then grabbed by the Minnesota Department of Health and MMB and sucked into their COVID-19 and sucked into their COVID-19 
um, dashboard. So this uh, data you can see under social distancing on the dashboard here. And that gets updated daily. We have a really great relationship that we've built up with MMB so that um, data sharing happens really seamlessly now. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so I think member Barbara already talked about this um, earlier. Um, so Metro Transit, we're also um, in close coordination with them to analyze reductions in ridership along with reductions in traffic on our roads and freeways. Um, they're seeing really stark decreases in the nine to five commuter routes, um, the express bus routes, and um, notably the North Star, North Star route um, service or uh, ridership on that has almost disappeared. Um, overall, the system is down 70 to 80%, um, and the Metro Transit is trying to manage the system both for social distancing capacity on the buses, giving people space, um, while still essential, supporting essential trips around the area. You can go to the next slide. Thanks, Greg. So this is just some of the research that we've started and we compiled as quickly as we could, but we want, are looking into using other sources of data to measure social distancing, um, social distancing um, under the new normal now, and then also the return to normal over time. We're developing collaborations with transportation scientists at the University of Minnesota um, to do some of this work. Um, and we are really interested in using these data and other data sources to look at the long-term effects of COVID-19 on travel around the area, on the economy, and on ridership. We're going to continue our collaboration with MMB as long as it's useful to them. Um, and we've also just developed some great relationships with um, data scientists at MnDOT and Metro Transit that we want to keep those relationships strong going forward so we can do these kind of innovative, innovative cross-department collaborations. Thanks. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there questions for Ms. Asmus on this matter? I have a question. Um, I have a yes. question. I have a question, Mr. Chair. And this who is, is it? Jones. Mary Jo. Uh, Commissioner ahead. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Ashley. Um, so we've been hearing reports about um, even though there's less cars on the road and less things going on, I'm I'm just wondering um, what you think of why there's um, been an increase in accidents, or not an increase, but proportionally. There's been a lot of accidents. So, have you done any research on that? I know that you've done any research on that. This was a, you're you're mainly doing met, met metropolitan transit, but as far as MnDOT, um, or has is anyone keeping track of why there's so many? Why that's up a little bit? Um, Commissioner McGuire, yes, I'm not specifically looking into accidents, but there are people at MnDOT who are doing that research. Um, and uh, is there anyone actually on the panel who can speak to that today? Yeah, this is, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Yeah, we've been tracking in um, the actual overall, um, the actual overall number of accidents has been about between 40 to 50% less, but the fatalities are are up and there's, there's different theories that people were looking at. There's things about the possible increase in speed. So there's, been some looking into that, though the, the data we're seeing, it's just a few miles an hour. Uh, more more of it's looking towards those that probably are doing the risky behavior are still continuing to do such. But there's more gathering of information that's being looked in and, and, and tracked, and we're trying to find out some more. But yes, actual fatalities are higher than a year ago, even though there's okay. thank, significant... Thank you for damage. that. Right. Other, other questions for... Ms. Asmus or, or Member Barnes? All right, uh, Ashley, thank you very much for the presentation. Pretty fascinating uh, look at uh, how comprehensive this whole issue is of uh, social distancing and, and all the different aspects of state government that are working on, uh, on, on assessing it and its impact. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. We'll look forward to hearing more about it as we go along. Can sure. we get an up I think maybe we should think about uh, an update uh, on this monthly in terms of the impacts of social distancing. Okay. Sure, that's something we can do for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I've asked for a similar. I've asked for a similar thing for our transportation committee. So I think because it's helpful to see what the impacts are, not just of the ramp down, but then the ramp back up and how that plays out. Good. Thank you, Member Barber. Um, all right, let's move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is the uh, approval of the minutes. And we've got two sets of minutes. I think we can handle them in a single motion. 
Is there anyone who wishes to modify the uh, regular meeting minutes for either February 19th or March 20th, 2020 meetings? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve both sets of minutes, February 19th and March 18th, 2020. This is Myron Bailey. I'll make the motion on that. Thank you, Mayor. And is there a second? Mayor Heyman Rowland, second. Thank you. Thank you, Mayors. Uh, any further discussion? Further discussion? Roll call, please, Jana. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Boyles. Boyles. Frank. Aye. Crimmins. Aye. Degan. Aye. Aye. Fox. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Giuliani Stevens. Aye. Gattel. Aye. Cayman Rowland. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Aye. Hollinshead. Aye. Karlowski. Aye. Lindicky. Aye. Look. Aye. Malichnik. Aye. Beelin. Aye. McGuire. Aye. Narayanan. Aye. Patrick. Aye. Wright. Aye. Lewis. Aye. Schumber. Aye. Stephenson. Aye. Swanson or Jepson? Tolbert. First. Tolbert. Ulrich. Aye. Winshittle or Wang? And Washi or McDonald? Hovland. Hovland? Chair? All right, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Um, I thought she was expecting me to vote when clearly I can't vote. So um, uh, motion carries. Minutes are approved uh, for February 19 and March 18, 2020. Uh, I did jump by uh, Chair Freeze's TAC report. I was assuming that uh, she could handle that uh, when we get to the business items. Uh, but I should go back here and... Uh, Check with TAC Chair Freeze to see if there's anything she wanted to report on before we get into the regular business items. Chair Freeze? No, I saw her there. Chair Freeze? Lisa? Yeah, I see her. Can you get off mute? There you are. Is my mic working now? No, you're working. Is it off mute? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll defer my report until the action items. All right, well then let's just leave you off uh, mute and we'll move right into the action items. The first one we have uh, is a consent agenda item. It's a streamlined TIP amendment, uh, the MnDOT related uh, uh, action. And Mr. Freeze, do you want to take that one? It's 2020-17. Sure. Um, Hello? Who else is here? Somebody else uh, trying to talk? Okay, this is a, this is a streamlined TIP amendment um, and it, it is coming to you. Uh, MnDOT was awarded funding for the Federal Transit Administration. This is the 5310 Enhanced Mobility Funding for Seniors and Disabilities Program. It's a program that's administered by the MnDOT Office of Transit. 
uh, these projects have gone through a grant application process. Um, and the timing of the selection process does not fit in with uh, our normal TIP development cycle. So in order for RISE, uh, the grantee in this particular case, to purchase its vehicles, an amendment is needed to identify those purchases in the TIP. Um, this amendment went through our um, uh, revised streamlining TIP, uh, TIP amendment process, and it meets all of the uh, requirements. The TIP amendment uh, meets the fiscal constraint requirement. Uh, it's consistent with the TPP and um, with the regional air quality conformity. Uh, this was reviewed by the PAC or by the on 41 and they're recommending approval to the transportation advisory. Thank you, Chair Freeze. We could have handled this uh, as, a, as shown on the agenda as a consent agenda item, but because we only had two items that were business related items uh, and not information items, I thought we should get an explanation on this. And basically it is that MnDOT is adding uh, vehicles, uh, a vehicle purchase into the tip for purposes of uh, the enhanced mobility for seniors and disabilities program, which is the section 53 section 10 program. Is that a, a brief summary, Chair Freeze? Yes, it is. Thanks. All right. Mr. Is Chair, there... I would move approval. Approval. Uh, uh, Mayor Mary. All right, uh, thank you. Mayor, is there a second? <laughs> Need a second on 2020-17. Uh, Mayor Bailey can make that second. Thank you, Mayor Bailey. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please, Jana. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Father. Aye. Aye. Boyles. Boyles. Crimmins. Crimmins? Dugan? Aye. Aye. Fox? Aye. Geisler? Aye. Giuliani Stevens? Cattell? Aye. Heyman Rowan? Aye. Hansen? Aye. Colbert, Collinshead. Aye. Aye. Kowalski. Aye. Lindeke. Aye. Look. Aye. Malichnik. Aye. Aye. Bewin. Aye. 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 McGuire. Narayanan. Aye. Patrick. Patrick? Wright? Aye. Lewis? Aye. Schumber? Aye. Stephenson? Aye. Tolbert? Yes. Ulrich? Aye. And that's it. Very good. Uh, motion passes. 2020-17 is approved. Uh, one other item that we need to deal with uh, that was not on the consent agenda is uh, the result of a conversation we had last month about looking at the deadline for the 2020 regional solicitation. And uh, Chair Freeze is going to walk us through that uh, so that we can make some decisions about uh, the timing of the uh, uh, regional solicitation for this this year. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Hovland. Um, at the March 18th meeting, you'll recall that the TAB voted to extend the regional solicitation deadline from April 16th to May 15th due to the additional strain placed on partner agencies uh, due to COVID-19 COVID outbreak. Uh, given the uncertainty about the outbreak, the TAB agreed to revisit this at this meeting. 
Uh, and um, to prepare for that, the council staff uh, requested additional information for potential applicants, asking them to identify uh, their concerns with the new extended application deadline. Um, they did receive um, comments from Carver County, Move Minnesota, Anoka County and Washington County as a part of that outreach. Uh, the, tab, the TAC actually met twice to discuss these concerns. At their regular meeting on April 1st, uh, those items were reviewed uh, and commented and shaped. Um, and I think it was uh, overall uh, concluded that most applicants felt that they would be able to complete the May 15th dead, deadline. So um, just keep in mind that, that the uh, discussion here really went beyond the, the four comment letters to the full PAC committee and their member agencies uh, contributing to this discussion. Um, there is concern about um, getting letters of support from partner agencies and staff had recommended that uh, that deadline be extended um, to uh, September 1st and uh, the TAC discussion concurred with that concept. So it would mean that, so would mean that um, at the time the applications are due on May 15th, if they're not able to secure uh, partner agency support letters, they would be brought in uh, later and then uh, the ultimate deadline would be September 1st when they bring together the, the final scoring um, of all of the items. Another area of concern was public engagement. There were a number of agencies that expressed concern that they had public meetings uh, scheduled um, in particular to focus in on uh, some of the equity scoring measures and those meetings had to be canceled as a result of the uh, COVID outbreak. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about this and clarification from council staff. Quite a bit of discussion about this and clarification from council staff about um, how uh, the scoring was intended on this. Uh, I think it was um, made very clear to all the members uh, of TAC that um, the purpose of this is to really get out in front of projects with uh, public engagement and and if you were just having a project level engagement, although it was important, it's not um, gonna carry as much weight as the overall uh, public engagement process from beginning to end on the projects. So uh, I think what was concluded is that, especially for those agencies that were planning and had to cancel those engagements, that if they have them scheduled or completed, um, um, and they discuss that in their applications, there'll be consideration given in the scoring for that. Um, and then um, the other element that was discussed is that many agencies, in particular smaller agencies, um, may find it difficult uh, because of uh, other and additional priorities and working arrangements um, to get the regional solicit solicitation applications uh, prepared. And I think over the course of the month, it's become clear um, among most of the agencies seated around the table uh, that, that I think there was enough confidence uh, among that group and consensus uh, that they would be able to get these applications prepared. One other item that was uh, important to, to consider was data collection uh, because uh, the COVID outbreak and a hit in the early preparation stages of applications and about the time when agencies might have been out obtaining additional traffic counts um, that, uh, as you heard earlier, uh, the traffic counts that would have been obtained um, in late March would have been obtained um, in late March and highly skewed due to the COVID-19 outbreak. So. There's a discussion about what would be acceptable. Um, perhaps older counts would be acceptable or um, utilizing MnDOT Streetlight and the council streetlight license to help agencies that didn't have, not have suitable uh, alternative counts for that. Uh, and so I know after the last meeting at, at TAC, there was a discussion about um, council staff at least communicating out to potential applicants 
the availability of streetlight data or the traffic count situation. Um, I think one other item that was concern is that in, if, in particular during this time of financial uncertainty, that there would be difficulty uh, perhaps getting agencies to commit to the local match, um, getting um, even partner agencies on projects uh, on board to financially uh, commit due to the uncertainties. But that uh, is something that we'll, we'll just have to continue to work through um, uh, on that particular issue. I think the final thing when we did a round robin uh, is that a number of people spoke about the importance of us moving on with this process and getting projects selected in particular because uh, then we can get projects out the door and hopefully keep the economy moving. Uh, the, the other um, component of that is that it may put us in a better position as we move forward if an infrastructure stimulus bill emerges such as the era uh, legislation. So based on that, um, our recommendations is to move forward with uh, uh, continuing that May uh, 15th deadline uh, to uh, have the tab allow required letters of support be submitted by 9-1-2020 that the outreach meetings canceled during the COVID-19 outbreak be considered for points in the equity outreach scoring measure and that the um, tab allow the use of uh, street light intersection turning movement counts or data older than three years in lieu of, lieu of um, collecting data at this uh, time when there's atypical traffic patterns um, experienced. So with that, I'll be open to any questions that people may have. And Steve, I'm sure if there's any questions or comments you want to add to what I might have missed, that'd good. be That's a good, good. Uh, summarization, uh, Chair Freeze. Uh, Commissioner Ulrich. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Lisa, if, if we knew, and you mentioned this at the very end of your uh, comments, if we knew that there was going to be a massive transportation bill of a couple trillion dollars and, and a lot of extra money was going to come into our region and perhaps they would even um, change uh, extra money was going to come into our region and perhaps it would even uh, change the match formula. Uh, would that change the desired deadline date if we were to encourage all our, our people in our region, all our government units to make sure they get uh, more applications in in this time and not less? You mentioned the match concern. Would they have money to match so they're not going to turn in an application or the deadline and the struggle with the deadline, they're going to maybe turn in less because of the, the time frame. And But if we had this extra money coming to the region, wouldn't we want to um, extend the deadline? Wouldn't we want to encourage all our partners to turn in more applications uh, in anticipation? You could just about bet that they're going to have a bill to, to stimulate the economy, economy related to infrastructure and transportation. Um, so I guess comment on that. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Do, I mean, are we, are we doing the right thing here? Well, um, I think that's a good point. I mean, one of the discussion items that we had with regard to that is these projects that we're selecting are for program year 24-25. And um, oftentimes when these stimulus bills come forward, what, what is desired are projects that you can get out within a year. Maybe they'd be projects that we could move up or add to the scout in a year. Maybe the projects that we could move up or add to the scope that are already in the existing pipeline. I know they like to get new projects. There may be some of these projects that could be ready to go, um, but, but there would be challenges for each of these projects that are being applied for right now because of the federal environmental process and the federal right-of-way process. Um, it's a good point. I think it's something to be considered. It might also be a reason for us to be ahead of the curve and get through this process so that as that emerges from the federal government, we're ready as a region to take on that task. Commissioner, I think it's a, it's a great point. I'm, you're causing me to think back to uh, 08 and ARA when you and I were on the tab and uh, we had a great number of projects that were shovel ready as they defined it at that point in time. So I think the question for Chair Freeze is, um, are there projects that uh, could come in here that 
could potentially meet a definition or the old definition of shovel ready that we could advance if we saw some additional funding coming to our region that had to be spent within a finite period of time? Or would we rely on our, our uh, local units of government, whether they be cities or counties uh, or MnDOT, to try to uh, create shovel ready projects as quickly as possible to meet any time deadlines that the federal government might impose for receipt of funds? Uh, Elaine has her hand up and she has some input on this issue. Elaine. One thing I want to remind you is that when we get the applications in, in previous years, TAB has only been funding about half of the projects submitted. So we do have plenty of projects coming in. And, and I would just, Commissioner I would just add. Hey. Go ahead. Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner. Stan Karwalski speaking. Um, I know from Washington County's perspective, um, we do submit only the projects we think uh, qualify and that are shovel ready. And uh, I do believe there are, uh, obviously we get turned down a lot of projects and every county and city does. So uh, I would agree, it would seem that there's a lot of extra projects already in the pipeline. Although to uh, add to Commissioner Ulrich's uh, point, perhaps if we knew the um, rules of qualifying with an expanded budget, maybe there would be some new rules that it would be nice to know what those rules are. And then maybe we could think of other uh, types of projects that would be brought to the table because of any kind of new rules on the ex on extra money. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Steve uh, Peterson may have some input on that. Steve, well, you're still on. You you don't look like you're on mute, Steve, but you're on mute. Now you're okay. Let's see. No, you're still on mute, even though it looks like you're not. I wonder, Greg, can you assist? Still no, nothing. Steve Peterson, Chair, is that Steve Peterson? Yeah, Steve Peterson. He's unmuted. You're he's unmuted, muted. Steve, so I don't know. What would be the problem, Greg? Is he not, has he got his computer uh, audio off? Uh, he may, okay. yeah, there's something on his equipment and he's, he's unmuted Come on now. in the car. There, there you go. He's on there now. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Quick, a um, little, little, little different uh, topic. So I didn't want to steer away from it if we were still talking on this topic. But um, related to the action item, I did want to mention that we did have quite a bit of discussion about the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP. And um, at the last TAC meeting, again, that's something that does come through. Uh, this body for an approval both for the application and the projects themselves at the same time as the solicitation and the tech and the uh, group although it's not in the action item because we just met on monday um, is recommending that we follow our similar suit and extend that deadline from what it currently is june 1st back one month to july 1st uh, to give people an additional um, month on those HSIP applications. So is that something you'd want to cover in this particular motion, or is that going to come to us separately? Uh, we, we would prefer to uh, cover that now, um, if possible, to amend, uh, amend the motion that has the items uh, currently and, and uh, add an item in there about HSIP and extending that deadline out to July 1st. Mr. Chair, I would make a motion to, to uh, for 2020-18 letter of extension, use of the streetlight data and use of the streetlight data and media use of the streetlight data, reach meetings being extended, as well as the extension of the HSIP, HSIP from June 1st to July uh, 1st. I think that covers it all, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think that uh, I'm looking at the requested action recommended motion. I think it might be clarifying if as part of your motion, you had uh, in there that we keep the deadline for submission at May 15th, 2020. And I would, 
um, make that. I would include and then, that. And then Thank add to Chair. that that the motion include the extension of the HSIP deadline to July 1, 2020. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, I think All I right. said it, but maybe okay. you didn't hear. Thank you. I'll second right, it, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And who was that? Baluch next. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Um, further discussion? Chair, uh, Susan Sanger is indicating she wants to speak on this issue. Thank you. All right. Member Sanger? Member Sanger? I think we just lost her. Uh, yeah, it looks like she, looks like she just lost the call. She's she's calling okay. in on her phone, and it looks like it kind of dropped. All right. Do you want to uh, maybe, Greg? Do you want to talk to her and ask her what the question is that she wants to pose, and I'll restate it to the group, or you can restate it. Or don't you? Can't you tell yeah, her I'll, what I'll, phone number she was uh, calling from? I know what phone, her phone number isn't listed on there anymore. I can I can okay. try to call her and see. If you have the uh, member list, Elaine might be able to call her too. If Elaine has the membership list in front of her. I will send Greg her number. Thank you. All right, she's gonna to attempt to call back in. Thank you. Yes, Member Barnes. Yes, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to just double check here because I'd sent in kind of the message here about that. And so it is in the in the new proposal here about having uh, July 1st and for HSEP, I just wanted to clarify. Yes, it is part of the motion. Okay. All right, just had to double check, thanks. If you look at the at, at the requested action recommended motion, we've added in uh, two elements to it. The first is that the uh, we would keep the deadline for submission uh, of projects uh, to be included in the 2024-25 uh, TIP uh, at May 1st, 2020, and then You'd go, uh, one would become two, two would become three, Hello? three would become four, Hello? and then uh, five is the uh, ad addition of the uh, uh, HSIP deadline to July 1, 2020. All right, is Member Sanger, is that you? Yes, this is Sue Sanger. Yes, go ahead, Member I Sanger. Had a, I, my comment was on the um, item that we were talking about as far as um, the public engagement and how that has been curtailed in the process. And, and here is my concern, that by doing it the way it is proposed, which it's totally understandable to me that we can't have public hearings for public process. But I think we it would be helpful if we could build into our regional solicitation process perhaps this year only, some additional points for those uh, governmental agencies that find substitute ways, substitute ways of public engagement, uh, whether that be by emails um, or call-ins or however they're going to do it, uh, but to, to encourage entities to still do outreach on these projects that they are submitting. And I, I say this as a longtime council member, if you don't have public engagement, then there's an uproar that people that projects are being done behind people's backs. And I would prefer to give people an incentive to add um, whatever public engagement processes, you know, can be done safely at this time. All right. Thank you for that comment, 
it is an interesting situation here where we have some deadlines we're trying to meet. I know from a council standpoint uh, in Edina, what we're doing now is having uh, a public hearing matter and then people can submit uh, uh, testimony in, in a variety of different ways, but we leave the matter open for another week for supplemental comments and then the council would act the following week. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a little bit complicated in this situation where we need to set some deadlines here. Uh, so I think it's something worthwhile thinking through and I thank you for that comment. Okay. All right. Any other? Chair Hovland? Yes. Chair um, just it... just a, a kind of a point on that. This is kind of the focus public engagement for um, kind of the equity outreach. And one of the things that, in my observation with this is it really is something that is hard to do with some of the alternate means that we do have available. And I think uh, the councils and the discussion was that we'll do what we can on this, uh, but some of it doesn't substitute for having that meeting in that mobile home park or the uh, meeting uh, in a, a neighborhood community center uh, that brings people um, together uh, that might not have participated through these electronic measures. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. You know, one of the things I would I would say is we should be thinking about between, uh, let's assume that we pass 2020-18 in the, in the form made, this is advisory to the Met Council. There'll be a gap period now between the time we make this recommendation and it comes to the council. That, that to me seems like a natural period of time. And Member Barber, do we have like two weeks or when does this come in front of you? I am not positive when it's scheduled. Nick, do you know? I would assume it really quickly. If it's, uh, if it's two weeks to a month out, then it seems to me that we've got an adequate amount of time for due process to occur because it's a recommendation from the advisory board to the Met Council. And uh, you've got to either vote it up or vote it down. But nonetheless, that gap period gives people the time to have the due process that they might not otherwise have. Uh, assuming that they know about it in some form or fashion. So that's something for staff to look at as well. Okay, any other discussion, questions, comments? All right, uh, I think we'll go then to the vote on 2020-18 as stated. Uh, and as I think everybody understands the motion. Uh, Jana, roll call, please. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Boyles. Boyles. Aye. Crimmins. Crimmins. Began. Aye. Foster. Aye. Fox. Aye. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Juliana Stevens. Aye. Gattel. Aye. Hammond Roland. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Holberg? Yes. Holland said. Aye. Karlowski. Aye. Linda Keith. Aye. Look. Aye. Malichnik. Aye. Buen. Aye. McGuire. Aye. Nariani. Aye. Patrick. Aye. Reich. Aye. Lewis. Aye. Schember. Aye. Stephenson. Aye. Tolbert. Yes. 
All right. Aye. All right, Chair, the roll has been called. Is that it, Jana? Yep, All that's right. it. All right. 2020-18 uh, is approved uh, as made. Uh, thank you, everybody, for that uh, good work uh, in an awkward sort of situation. Um, now, that completes our business items, and so we can move on to the information portion of the agenda. Uh, Amy Venowitz is just going to give us a uh, quick overview of uh, some of the other uh, chapters on the 2040 TPP, and then uh, that'll be uh, an encouragement on her part to, for us to send in comments as soon as possible. Chapters six through uh, 13, we've covered chapters one through five already. And so, uh, Amy, are you there, Ms. Venowitz? Uh, yep, Mr. Chair and members, Amy Venowitz with MTS here. Can you hear me? We can. Good, so uh, as you said, today I have a very short PowerPoint to cover the proposed process and schedule for completing the TPP update. TPP update. And specifically, I'm going to cover some recent language that we are proposing to add into the plan regarding um, the COVID-19 event. So if you could go to the next slide, Greg. Essentially, at this point in time, we are proposing to leave the schedule for adopting the TPP update unchanged. Um, just a quick reminder, in May, the tab, uh, we'll see a business item to recommend the update for public comment. The council will adopt that recommendation or, and release the plan for public comment in mid-June. We would have, have public comment mid-June through August, or mid-June through July, excuse me. Early August and September, we would revise and respond to the public comments. And then TAB would again see the updated changes and make a recommendation in October, and the council would adopt the update in November. So the biggest change that's really occurring at this point in time is that um, obviously all, all these meetings are happening online and that we are hoping that most comments are provided in written fashion rather than getting them through numerous committee hearings. And um, given that, we are kind of in a rolling process of accepting comments from all of the committees. We're keeping a spreadsheet, tracking the comments, and incorporating changes into the update and into the public comment document as, we're, as we receive them. So just a quick reminder that this piece of the process is really aimed at putting the best document possible out for public comment. So your input, the input from TAC, the input from tax committees and other committees is great technical input and feedback and it helps us put the best possible document out for public comment. So that's our overall goal and hoping to stick with the schedule that we had originally planned. So um, going to the next slide, the one other change that we are proposing at this point in time is we recognize that it would not make a lot of sense to release a plan that doesn't recognize the COVID outbreak and the substantial changes that, that, that this event is going to have, is having right now and will have into the future. So from the last time you have seen the chapters, we have added language specifically recognizing the COVID outbreak and that language specifically recognizing the COVID outbreak and that language has been incorporated into the overview, the highway transit, bike and ped, aviation and work program chapters. And also I, I don't have it on the list here, but the equity chapter also isn't now including language related to the COVID outbreak. Basically the knowledge or, or the language is aimed at just acknowledging the overall event and the significant impacts it will have in the short term and in the long term. And then also acknowledging that we do not at this point in time know what these impacts are going to be for the long term. We know they're probably going to be 
significant. And so the most significant and important thing we're doing at this point in time is also adding three work program items into the work program chapter specifically aimed at analyzing the impacts of the COVID event. So if you go to the next slide, Greg, uh, slide four, thank you. So the, the work program items, um, and these are new since the last time you saw the work program chapter. The first new work program item is related to looking at travel behavior changes in the short and long term. We are right now in the process of getting a contract out to do a special household survey during the COVID stay at home order. And um, it will be specifically with respondents who responded to the TBI survey over the past year and a half. So we'll be able to, to compare travel patterns from previous to the COVID event, during the COVID event, and then with a follow-up survey for after the COVID event, and probably rolling over time so we can see how people's travel begins to return to normal over time. So that will be a pretty big uh, piece of work. It will also help us look at uh, trip purposes and how non-essential versus essential trips changed, and then also the significant impact of t telecommuting during the COVID event. So that is a piece that will be led by Jonathan Ehrlich, and it's kind of an overall piece of our TBI work overall. The second new work program item is uh, financial impacts analysis for both the highway and transit systems. We know that our revenue sources have seen really significant changes during this event. Um, the growth assumptions moving into the future need to be re-looked at and likely brought downward and might lead us to some future spending adjustments in the current revenue scenario. So, and we know this needs to happen. It's important. There will be significant revenue impacts but at this point in time, we just really need to commit to studying and adjusting in the future. And then the third major work pro program item is looking at the impacts to the aviation system. Similar to highways and transit, we know, and maybe more so, we know that airline passenger travel demand is way down. Um, we have a lot of capacity in the system, revenues are down. We would like to look at the differences between business and personal travel impacts. And, and this is a piece of work that we would imagine doing really hand in hand with MAC. So those are the three major work programs, uh, items that are being added to the TPP. The remaining chapters that were linked to the agenda you've all seen in the past few months and really the only changes that um, are significant are what we have added regarding the COVID language. Next week, we will send out the remaining five chapters, the supporting chapters that have relatively few changes compared to the current plan. And so we're hoping the review process for those chapters will be fairly minimal for you. And we would ask that you send all of your comments and questions in writing to me or to Heidi Schalberg or Elaine. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions about the TPP update. So, uh, Amy, you said that you can send out information electronically on the remaining five chapters, but what I see on the agenda is eight chapters. So did I miss something there? Are you gonna send all of the um, chapters six through 13 out electronically so people can uh, look at them uh, and make comments in either a, a marked up version or a red line form? How, how do you want that? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair and members. So the chapters that are currently linked to the agenda are all, they're really the major modal chapters. These are all chapters that TAB received a presentation on in the past. So the highway, transit, bike and pet, freight, aviation were in front of TAB um, over the past couple months, but they now have COVID-related language. 
Next week, we will send out chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, um, and then one and two. And those chapters are what we call supporting chapters. They're not the modal investment chapters. And the changes in those chapters are very, very minimal. So that's why we haven't been focusing on them through presentations with TAB. We, wa we wanna share the changes with you, but I would be surprised if there are very many comments um, related to those chapters. And, but by the time we send, by the time we send those out next week, TAB will have seen the overview and then chapters one through 14 in total. Um, related to how we want to receive comments, I, we do not want to receive redlined versions or really track changes in any manner. We would prefer emails. If you have a page and chapter that you want to note, that would be helpful. And then just state the comment all right. through so an I email. Think what might be helpful to all the tab members would be if you, if you send all the chapters electronically, when you get ready to send those last, uh, that last section 10 through 13, send them all again so that people can go through it one more time. And then they, uh, they can do as you suggest, either send an email uh, with respect to a particular uh, page, paragraph, line reference, or they can uh, physically mark something up and send it to you, I suppose, as a PDF. Uh, and then... Um, you can deal with it that way. And then make sure you, you tell us by when you want these comments. You want them by May 15th, is that what I understand? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yes, we would. So TAB will actually be acting, I think, right around May 15th. But even if we receive the comments uh, the day of TAB's action, we will note the comment, put it in our tracking sheet, and potentially make changes in response to that comment before it goes out to public comment. Okay. So I will do what you asked and send out all the chapters at once. I, I want to emphasize, because I'm trying not to overwhelm people with review requests, the most important chapters to review are really the overview, the highway and transit chapters, the modal chapters, and then the work program chapter. The remaining chapters have changed very little. All right, very good. Well, I just think that it's good for people to have the entire document in front of them so they can have continuity too. So I think I'd sure. just, thank, thank you for doing that. All right, other questions for Ms. Venowitz? Mr. Chair? Uh, Mr. Yes. Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner McGuire. Yes, I have a question. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you, Amy, for this. I'm just looking at the slides and um, I see, can you just talk a little bit more about the travel, the household survey, which, which isn't being conducted now. That's just going to be part of the work program, right? So is that still being determined or just, can you talk a little bit about what that might look like, a household survey and who that might go to and just... Can, do you have any more information on that? Sure. Um, first of all, quick background on the travel behavior inventory. This is an ongoing piece of work that MTS does, and it's uh, in, it was already included in the work program. So we went two years ago to what we call a rolling uh, household survey where we ask the participants to keep track of their travel for one week through a smartphone diary and tracking their trip purpose and various trips made throughout that week in their household. We started the first survey um, started, in, started in 2018 and was completed in October of 2019. So that, and then we currently are planning to re-implement that survey this fall, but we'll likely be delaying that due to COVID. But what we are doing is implementing a new survey where um, by, where, um, by, where, where, um, by when our previous respondents indicated whether or not they would be willing to participate in future surveys. So we have a database of people willing to participate. And what we are intending to do in the next couple of weeks is go back to the people who responded to the survey in 2018 and 2019 
and re-ask them questions, it will likely just be a one day um, phone survey type thing that they can fill out online, not a full diary, but really get a handle on how their travel has changed during the COVID event. And we hope to do that during the stay at home shelter order and then return again to the same respondent sometime this fall as travel is beginning to increase again and then re return to them again next fall. And then hopefully um, at some point we will stop doing those surveys and return back to the normal TBI household survey. Any follow-up? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Amy? Amy, thanks for sending that out in its totality and then uh, we'll have about 30 days for folks to take a look at that and work, work on it. So I think with those addition of the, uh, of the new chapters, uh, it'll be interesting for us to think about this uh, in the future. Mayor Mary, did you, did you have a question? I saw your hand going up and down. Is, yeah, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Yes, I forget that I have to unmute. Uh, I appreciate Amy's comments with regard to COVID and its impact and how that will change um, today's and future, and future uh, travel behavior and how um, she commented on each one of the sections had um, something related to the impact that COVID is having on, on each area. So I, I thank her. I thank you, Amy, for that. And because we had some comments that we were going to submit to you, and you pretty much answered them. So thank you for that. Okay. Other other questions. Um. All right. Thanks, Amy. And then, uh, tab members, have any items? I've got a, a little bit here for you. I think it's interesting information. I was talking to some of the folks about early on, but uh, Member Holland's head. Um, I just wanted to see if any of the agency members or staff have an update on the $2 trillion that was already passed. I understand that uh, something over $200 million was going to come in operating funds to uh, Minnesota for transit. I don't know if that's true. Does anybody have detail on that? I realize it's not capital, so it's not directly TAB and uh, TAM related, but I'm curious. Member Barber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, there has there is money that's coming through um, to the region. It's two hundred twenty six million dollars in federal funds, and that will go to both Metro Transit and to uh, the suburban transit providers. Thank you. One of the interesting things, uh, Member Holmes, had that you caused uh, had that you caused me to think about is uh, under the CARES Act, there's two point two billion coming to our region. Uh, but the only direct payments are to units of government that are 500,000 people or more. So that leaves, that, that puts two units of government in that direct receipt category, and that's Hennepin and Ramsey County. And apparently then, based on the calculations that have been made, those two counties would receive something in excess of $300 million in direct payments. Uh, there would then be about one point. 8.5 to 1.9 billion coming to the state. Uh, well, a couple of questions uh, come to mind uh, for me, and that is, uh, with respect to Hennepin and Ramsey counties, first of all, I'll say it's the, and, and we've got some commissioners on the line that'd be interested in their input. Uh, the counties qualify because all of the, of all of the city population within those counties. And so the question I would have is, what does the county intend to do with those funds received? Are they going to use them for their own op or their operations, or are they going to uh, uh, pass that money downstream on a pro rata basis to the individual communities that help make up that 500,000 population base? I'm sure they've got plenty of pressures of their own. Uh, I think of Hennepin in particular with Hennepin County Medical Center. Uh, but I'm interested in knowing what sort of dialogue is going on at the county level about the receipt of these funds. And then secondly, with respect to the uh, 1.9 billion that will stay with the state, there's no mandate on the part of the federal government that that money has to be distributed downstream to cities that may need assistance or small businesses that may need assistance or rental assistance for people in our communities that are 
hardest hit. You know, I, I heard a data point the other day from the greater MSP that 86% of the people that are impacted here are, are making $40,000 or less per year. That's the, that's the strike point for most of the people that are getting hurt. And there's the big elephant in the room, I think, from a city standpoint has been the lack of uh, any programs around rental assistance to help those people that are already stressed to, uh, you know, both folks in a family working two, three jobs, and now they're out of work. So I don't know how uh, some of the counties are dealing with this or like I see Matt pop up on the screen here, uh, Anoka County that doesn't have that threshold level of uh, 500,000 in its county, what, what's it gonna do with respect to going to the state and saying, hey, wait a minute, what about, what about us? And same thing with uh, Washington County or Carver County, how, what, what's, what are the projections from our county commissioners that are direct recipients that are not direct recipients and also uh, the cities that are involved? So May Mayor, uh, Commissioner McGuire, you're right in the middle of my screen. Maybe you wanna address Ramsey County, what your, what, kind of discussions are going on there. I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I see that Commissioner Gattel from Hennepin County is also on the line and she raised her hand too. So I'm gonna have her speak after me and I will, I'll just speak as one of those larger counties that we represent um, all the same people in our cities and counties and our issues we're dealing with is food, in, food insecurity, housing and homelessness and jobs and economic development, which I think all of our people want. So we're putting that money into feeding our people into housing them and into finding jobs for them, and um, and also you know finding alternative healthcare facilities because we're the centers that are going to need more health facilities if we if that should be the case. So we we don't we don't want to be in competition with our cities, but we feel that we're serving the residents of those cities in those ways of providing these uh, incredibly crucial services, and it's. It's not enough. I mean, even the money we're getting from the federal government is not enough for all of us to, to do this work. But uh, we feel like we're, we're just doing survival work uh, in our county just to keep people alive and housed. So um, yeah, that's crucial money for the people that live in all of our 17 cities and, and St. Paul. Yeah. So we yeah. are definitely serving all those people. So I'd like Commissioner Gattel can uh, Add to yeah. what what they're doing. I think you're particularly positioned. You're positioned, well positioned too, to be dealing with some of these issues that you also deal with on a social yeah. services basis. Exactly. So, it seems to me that you you'll be more nimble than uh, than you know sending money downstream to cities and asking right. them to solve issues. Anyway, uh, Commissioner Gattel. Thanks. Well, one of the things that we have had a lot of discussion around is. What's going to happen when the dollars come down and what will be the restrictions on these dollars? We have no idea. One of the things that we've had a lot of discussion around is what's going to happen when will be the restrictions on these dollars. We have no idea what the restrictions might be, what we can and cannot spend them on. But let me tell you what the scenario looks like for Hennepin County right now. We're spending $5 million a week to house homeless people and put all the wraparound services into the hotels and keep homeless, homeless people in shelters all day long rather than having them out. And now we're trying to deal with the encampments that are growing. Um, so those we're trying to put social services down there to those people. We're trying to put washing stations for them to at least wash their hands. And we're looking at places we can actually put um, the bodies for these folks. So these are some of the big things that are immediate. And hospital too, which is seeing an increase of people coming in with COVID, uh, because they're not taking on any other type of work except not taking on any other work except those emergency cases, we're losing $60 million a month. So it, it's, and of course, we've not planned for this in any budget. But however, we are talking about things on the other side. We're talking about what jobs are going to be available on the other side of this. How do we quickly and nimbly move to make new job training and make those job trainings available to folks who need them so that they can quickly be retrained and get into another job? Because we know a lot of these things, some places are never going to open up. And so we need to move these people where we're going to need them. And a lot of it's going to be healthcare and a lot of the ancillary supporting services and manufacturing and stuff that we're going to try to move closer to home because we need to have a supply chain that's reliable. So there will be openings, but it might not, it may not be a career move. It may be a just a job to stabilize. I think stabilizing families, making sure we can keep them in their homes, making sure we can keep them in their rented apartments, 
that's a really big issue that we have right now, making sure that they, they get enough of the social, social services. We're wrapping a lot of things into online support, so you can go online. But And also we're looking at putting everything home because we have people who do not have you know, computers or internet at home. And so those people need a different way to get into these systems. So we're doing an awful lot of work around this, but you know, I, I have grave concerns that we won't come close to be made, being made whole for the dollars that are going on in Pacific County right now. And that will be a really big hole as we move forward. And how are we going to manage that and try to manage the social services that we have to? Because we are the safety net for these folks. My biggest yep. concern is that after we try to get a lot of these people out of the hotels housed, that we'll see another influx of homelessness because yep. there will be people who fall through the safety net. So I, I don't see a great scenario here. We're trying to prepare for what might happen. All right, good. I really appreciate those reports. And I, I think it would be beneficial if for both of the directors, city and county, if you had some uh, kind of communication with the cities involved uh, in your respective counties to tell them what you're working on. It takes some a little, a, a bit of the stress off of them too. Because as you point out, uh, Mary Jo, we're all trying to take care of the same folks that need our help. So that would be good to know. Now with respect to uh, Counties like uh, Scott and uh, Carver and, uh, and Anoka, Washington, I'd like to hear from you folks as well. I think it'd be beneficial for all of us to understand some of the challenges you're facing and, and uh, how we can go about helping you maybe at the legislature uh, with, with uh, receipt of funds that might help you do the same things that Hennepin and Ramsey County have talked about. Uh, member, uh, Commissioner Ulrich first. You're on mute, John. Yeah, 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 I know. I, know. I, I don't know that I can add uh, something to that right now, um, but I do I, I do want to mention something, a housekeeping item, and if this got mentioned, I apologize. Uh, I had to step away for a phone call, but apparently led, yesterday the legislature passed a, a bill that said we can only have uh, three of these uh, remote meetings a year if the public is not accessible to those meetings. So... Um, to keep going forward, you know, we've had two. Uh, it, we're going to have to provide some way in which the public can uh, be a part of the meeting. Whether you, whether Jimmy, uh, Mary Hovland, you're down at the Met Council and, and you're sitting there receiving members from the public uh, from a microphone or something. Apparently, we're going to be bound by this only three meetings if the public is not uh, allowed to attend. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting thought, John. I, I guess I could go back over to the council like we did last month, and then I could. Uh, people could come in with proper social distancing to testify, and I could take their testimony there with everybody else remote. So that's a, that's another idea. That's a, that's a decent idea. Okay. And then what about, uh, uh, John, with respect to, um, uh, is there any legislative strategy for any of the counties with respect to the legislature and the needs that you have in your county in terms of getting assistance out of that $1.9 billion fund? And I'm sure the State uh, already thinks they have a lot of needs for uh, John or Matt or Stan or, or um, where's Randy anyway. I'm not Matt. able to comment on that today. All right, Matt, anything from Minoka County with some of the discussions you're having so far? Well, I, I think we, we're looking at a new norm right now and we're all trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to land uh, given not only the the first two week closure, but then the extensions that are going on. We're getting extensive comment from our businesses and people that are unable to go to work because they're not deemed to be essential. That um, that they're having trouble, you know, financing uh, their mortgages and everything else that goes with that. And and how that shakes out, I think we have yet to find out. We're concerned about how the um, you know what does what does tax payment look like here, property tax payment look like, and how many people are going to be defaulting on that versus businesses, and how might we address some of that from the standpoint of uh, perhaps not charging the, the fine and interest um, uh, when it's not paid on time, and how we can try and alleviate something in that regard. I think our, our uh, human services are going to, you know, they're going to be hard hit here in trying to come up with this, and I'm sure that the state will have to try and determine all those dollars will will try and, try and be refilled. I mean, 
Um, from our standpoint, we have construction projects that were planned, capital improvement projects, and, and as chair of the finance committee, I'm recommending we pull back on all those things and, and keep our powder dry from the standpoint that we don't know, you know what our financial picture looks like going into the future here. Financial picture looks like going into the future here. And, um, and a double digit um, you know, tax increase to offset those expenses might not be well received by the public uh, and certainly would compound some of the, the problems that they're experiencing. So how we, how we try and financially tackle this is, is gonna be a challenge. Um, you know, we, um, we just keep moving forward and try and make the best decisions we can based on the information we have. And, uh, and I don't know that, um, you know, the governor kind of indicated that, uh, that you know, if the, the closures are just buying time. And, um, and essentially that, uh, that if you're going to get it, you're probably, you know, going to get it at some point. And whether you're asymptomatic or whether you're going to have light, uh, um, you know, effects to it, you know, that, that has yet to be seen. But we're, you know, we're, uh, we're struggling. There's no question about it. And we just keep keep hoping for the best right now and uh, keep trying to keep people positive and, and move forward. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, Commissioner Karwowski. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, basically uh, paraphrase uh, what Commissioner Buck said uh, for Washington County is very, very similar. Uh, and also Commissioner Ulrich's point, uh, it's kind of like a, a big tsunami wave is out there in the ocean. We know it's going to hit shore and it's, we're really bracing ourselves to try to pick up the pieces. We know we're going to have shortages of money, uh, not due to any, uh, you know, fault of our own residents or our own local businesses. I know in our suburban communities, I think we have much higher percent of businesses that are owned by their neighbors. You see, you see small businesses every day, uh, and these people are employing five, ten, and they're just going to be hit extremely hard. Um, so we're, uh, I, I wish the federal, now we have, like Ms. Commissioner Ulrich had said, we hadn't planned for any federal money because we haven't seen any. We're certainly working with our lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and locally with our state legislature to try to highlight uh, uh, influence uh, some relief for the counties. Uh, we haven't seen any, but we're trying to raise our 2020, uh, 2021 budget in anticipation of uh, hard times for citizens. So. Right now, we're taking the philosophy and our any of our spending for uh, the months leading out to be only essential spending. Uh, real careful on hiring, so that we're because we just don't know the ultimate effect of this COVID nineteen as we get a month, two months, six months, nine months from now. Um, uh, I think if the state legislature would do a, a larger bonding package and we could get uh, better uh, uh, contributions to some of our capital improvement projects at the county level, that would uh, help indirectly on the pressure on our uh, finding money for those projects because we do have to try to keep to some degree investing and spending money for that we're not part of the problem of uh, us going into recession, but yet we have to be conservative and mindful of, of, and respectful of the taxpayers. Um, and then uh, the unemployment that we're going to see, uh, it's really hard to predict, but uh, we're just trying to brace for it. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Malushnik. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we haven't given up on getting uh, direct payments from the feds uh, for smaller uh, units of government. So we, uh, we uh, keep that battle up through our national organization. And I know that yours is participating in that uh, conversation with our 
friends on uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Uh, we think it would be great. Um, we're looking at, uh, as Commissioner Look indicated, uh, delay of uh, and not charging people interest for being late on their, lo uh, their local property tax. But we think the best solution would be if the governor and the legislature would propose some type of statewide uh, uh, property tax relief of some form. And again, that would be most effective for the taxpayers and for government, uh, both state and local. So as far as the county goes, we are a wealthy county. So some of this is due to us. Uh, we're learning and innovating in both social services in the career centers. And uh, we've even got some, uh, we've got some folks that don't have access to computers and the internet. And so we're uh, having some of our social service applications, applications being distributed through some of our local businesses, ones that uh, folks would have to go to like uh, a local uh, uh, grocery market, those kinds of things. Housing for the first time, uh, we're actually providing hotel rooms in a, in a larger direct service way. And uh, we're supporting our nonprofits and providing food for those, those folks. On Friday and Saturday, we're working with Michael's Foods who have some product that they have to get rid of. It's not been sold, sold. So we got two locations in Carver County where several of us commissioners and county employees and a lot of other volunteers are going to pass out 4,000 meals. And uh, we're getting a lot of potatoes and eggs uh, for that. And uh, going off of uh, uh, Washington County's ideas, uh, we think it'd be a healthy time for bonding and, and more money for infrastructure. Uh, certainly, uh, I call it, and I'm going to be... Uh, promoting to my board that uh, we do some bonding. Again, we don't know how much money is out there. I get that, but uh, you're never going to get money cheaper and you're never going to get the facility built cheaper than in, uh, in the next year or so. So I'm, I'm behind the true, what I call the Truman uh, model, you know, down there in Independence, Missouri, he, uh, in the thirties during the most, uh, or even a little earlier even through the most uh, worst times there in his County, he proposed in, uh, and finance and did bonding for roads so that they could get the uh, food products to market and uh, it paid off in the long run. And so I, and kept the local, kept the local economy going. So I'm, uh, I'm all for that. If we want to, if we can do that, like I said, you never get the money cheaper. And again, the uh, contractors will probably, uh, those bids probably, uh, those bids will probably come in uh, lower than, than quite a long time, I would guess. So that's what we're trying to do, Chairman. Thanks for the opportunity to present that. Yeah, I'm glad that, uh, to hear from all of you. It was a nice venue to be able to hear from all of our county commissioners to see some of the, to hear about some of the issues that you're, you're all facing. Mr. Chair. Um, and do we have anybody Mr. from Dakota County? I don't think we did today. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Matt, look here. I just, um, I just wanted to say that it's, it's imperative that we get the attorneys back to work. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, sure. you know, one of the one of the topics that I think we've um, we've kind of heard discussions on is video conferencing and things of that nature, and um, and a lot of pushback by the courts on that. But with the courts being shut down and some of that very important work that they're doing, um, boy, now would probably be the time to allow some video conferencing and let some of these cases go through and and uh, cases be argued before judges and that. So uh, you don't have such a backlog in the legal system that we're kind of seeing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but it's important to get them back to work. Yeah, well, there you go. Thank you for that booster. I see uh, one of our colleagues has arrived from Dakota County. I can barely see her, but I see her. Uh, Chair Hovland, I've been on without my video on, but um... Dakota County, I think one of the interesting points we learned this week is that our unemployment <clears throat> numbers are in excess of 36,000, which is double what it was during the Great Recession, or kind of a point of comparison, if you will. Certainly, we hope the duration is not as long. Um, the other uh, issues are we opened bids on our smart center. They, they came in under projection. Um, there are people out there looking for work. And so we will uh, likely be going ahead with that project. 
our jail numbers. I don't think it was mentioned by any of the uh, commissioners, but all the jail numbers are down. There's been some talk about consolidating uh, jail functions and that um, we're back, we're down to levels under a hundred uh, people in the jail, which is uh, what the levels was in like the 1980s. And then I, and I hate to end on a sour note, but given my position as the chair of ways and means when there was a $6 billion deficit, I would guess that watching the way that the legislature is spending money, um, that uh, very likely that we should all brace for reductions in local government aids and county program aids because they can't make money in St. Paul and the economic uh, effects on the budget, I think are gonna be pretty devastating at the state level. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Um, all right, and I, I'll just pass on some quick information. Now, before uh, I was on this uh, call, um, I was on a call with the, the Urban Land Institute Advisory uh, Committee, and they've got this product council, the, and various uh, elements of the product council were reporting out. Uh, on the development side, uh, one of the um, co-chairs reported out, it was the uh, Doran Companies. Uh, and they've got a residential portfolio. And he said that uh, for April, this is an encouraging piece of news, for April, 94% of all rent uh, was collected. And that was the same as their pre-COVID rate. Now, what will happen in uh, May and, and June, I'm not sure. Uh, on the other hand, he said the commercial portfolio was really poor, uh, that there were that was not doing well at all, that many of the tenants were unable to pay their rent and were asking for... Uh, some kind of relief in some form or fashion. Um, and then uh, there was another fellow, Steve Brown, who reported out on, on medical office and uh, they're just uh, devastated there. Uh, physicians not taking salaries in some of these private medical practices, a bunch of layoffs, uh, private, even he said, even private physician groups asking their landlords for rental relief. Um, and then there was a report out by some people in the, in the capital and finance markets. Uh, I think the biggest news there was that the, uh, as you can well imagine, uh, the, uh, they, they've been having the triage to the greatest extent, hospitality and retail uh, loans. And the most challenging have been the hospitality loans, uh, many of them requesting forbearance because of the low occupancy rate, some looking for deferred payments. Um, and then some of the uh, uh, property owners uh, were reaching out to lenders for forbearance on some of their mortgage obligations, but they still weren't uh, prepared. Uh, Fannie Mae has a program apparently where you can, if you agree to uh, forbear or uh, defer collection from your tenants, uh, you can get some relief from Fannie Mae, but they kind of wanted to have it both ways. They wanted to be able to evaluate each tenant, but they wanted the relief from the federal government. So he said there was some of that going on. Um, and uh, customers are also at the banks, customers are drawing on credit lines at double the rate they were, they were doing before uh, the great, the uh, great recession in 2008. You can imagine that. I thought that was an interesting data point. Uh, the hospitality industry again, hit the hardest, uh, little to no lending and hospitality. And then this was something uh, in the retail grocery area, 50 to 70% of the, um, Grocery store outlets were paying uh, their rent. I, I thought it would be higher with all of the activity they've been having. But at the outlet mall level, only 20% of those folks were paying their rent. Um, office still was at 90% uh, for April on rents collected. Um, uh, and they think that they're gonna have to go in and retrofit some of these office buildings uh, with the better air handling equipment. Uh, more social distancing strategies for a while and then enhance the cleaning standards for everybody for quite a while. Uh, and the big winners in the, uh, in the real estate area have been uh, data centers. Uh, those people that are invested in data centers, the value of those businesses is up 12% year to date. Uh, and the other big winners are warehousing, as you can well imagine, uh, Amazon searching the whole country for additional warehouse space to handle all this online business. So those were kind of the, 
winners and losers in the in the real estate area I thought you might also appreciate knowing something about. Um, so that's it for for me. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has anything for the for the good of the tab, good of the order before we adjourn. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, this is Chris Geisler. Um, just a couple of other numbers to add into you from the manufacturing sector. Um, we've had almost an 800% increase in our online activities of as far as people go. You know, we, we manufacture durable goods. A lot of people go to a store to buy it. It's all online now. Um, so the interesting thing we've heard is even potential, our sales structures may flatten back to what we thought we were going to do in the first place. The challenges we've had is that our supply chain of all of our all of these producers who make all the parts that go into all this and then all the transportation systems and because those supply chains are so in, not only just interstate but intercountry, those disruptions are trickling their way through as inventory gets burned down. And so there's been I've heard a lot of things about how manufacturing may be impacted even months after orders get released because it just takes time to spool the supply chain and, and fill the pipeline back up. So just some other things that we've, we've been experiencing in the manufacturing sector. Yeah, it's a, those are fascinating comments, uh, Member Geisler. Um, I was on a call the other day with uh, Greater MSP and they've been working with some of those larger businesses in the region. And uh, everybody now is thinking about it. I think uh, Commissioner uh, Gattel mentioned this. What, what is the future of work? What does work look like? And that's something I think we're all going to have to be thinking about that are involved in government or otherwise about that future of work. And we've got to start thinking about that sooner rather than later. Um, and certainly some of these supply chain issues uh, with respect to uh, PPE, uh, we're going to have to solve that and pharma pharmaceuticals as well. And we can't, can't be just shopping the cheapest place in the world to get something made that's just not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know if anybody else had any other comments. Otherwise, we will uh, sign off. Uh, Lane will stay Chair. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, well, one, I think it was a great movie uh, meeting. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, uh, I think everybody had good, good conversations, and the meeting moved along nice. But the other thing in closing, I was going to say regarding the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, even though there's a lot of issues going on. It's sure been inspirational to see so many good things happening, uh, people rallying in the community uh, across the country, and the first responders, you know, frontline responders to just everybody helping and kicking in. And there's a, a I must say, the constituents have a lot of patience and understanding that this is beyond their control. So. There are some uh, uh, kind of inspirational things happening. I thought I'd just mention that. Yeah, that's a great observation. I think that too, locally, the level of goodness and kindness of people to others and thinking about others first is at an all-time high, I'd say. <laughs> it's impressive, uh, uh, you know, how humans are treating each other, I think. And so to sign off, uh, this is for Matt Look. Thanks, Matt. I got my own coffee today. Uh, sorry I couldn't get one for you. Uh, I saw you drinking one earlier and I had to go get one. So uh, for all well, of you, you. It, was great, it was great to see all of you. It looked like you're doing well under the circumstances and um, we'll sign off and uh, we'll let uh, we'll let Greg uh, close down the meeting and uh, thanks and we'll see you all in a month. Bye everybody. Thank see you. everyone. Bye.